Hi, and welcome back. Uh, today uh, is our final section of the basics, and um, I'm going to be discussing, uh, really this is an overview of uh, a discovery I made that um, we are op actually operating under three systems at once, but thinking there's only one system. And uh, the problem with that, and I'm going to describe how and why this came about. The problem uh, with having just one system as a lens to look at the other two systems, and again, I will explain what these are. The problem of having this lens is that there's miscommunication and um, shorts in the wiring between uh, true communication between all three systems we're using in music. And the overriding system that is causing all the problems right now is the current system that they're taught uh, that you're taught in school which is what I call the major minor key system okay um, now uh, let me explain let me give you an idea of how and why this all came about okay the major minor key system was developed along the time of temperament the temperament of the scale prior to the temperament of the scale I've explained this before, prior to the temperament of the scale, you couldn't have keys interact with each other, meaning if I'm in, I have a song in the key of C and I want to import a D7 chord, which properly comes from the key of G, uh, that D7 chord would sound out of tune in relation to the key of C, okay? Um, so that's where the problem was. What temperament did was to solve this problem by slightly tweaking each of the notes we play uh, out of tune. Believe it or not, the system we're listening to today is slightly out of tune. Um, and that's the system we are currently under the uh, hypnotic spell of. The truth of the matter is we have three systems and they're not cross-talking at all. And when they do cross-talk, what you get is confusion. I can only liken this to uh, if you took, uh, I don't know, African Bushman who has no access to technology and you began explaining a carburetor to him, he wouldn't have a context for understanding that. And that's what it's like when you try to explain the Greek modes through the major minor key system or explain the blues through the modes or whatever. So here are our three systems. The Greek modes, and that's the original system that came about. The major minor key system, which is the system we're currently using. And the third system is the blues. Now, in other words, the way I describe these two systems, I call the Greek modes the isolated keys. The major minor key system, I call it interactive keys, meaning you can have the keys interact with each other now. And the third system of blues is key blending. And all of these follow different laws and rules. And uh, we've yet to come up with a synthesis. In fact, nobody even has made, has really uh, uh, made the distinction that there are these three systems. I'm the guy that's coming along and saying, hey, guys, look at this, okay? Now, uh, we could look at these three as almost historical phenomenon in the sense that, uh, phenomena in the sense that when I say there are three chord qualities, major, minor, and seventh chords, you could say that the Greek system is based on the major chord. Because why? Because the, uh, the fifth chord in that key is a, what's called a dominant seventh, and it resolves to the first major chord of the, of the key. So uh, we could say in a sense it's biased toward the major uh, uh, key sound. When temperament uh, happened, uh, a great deal of complexity and sophistication entered into it because now you're combining 12 different keys possibly. And in fact, every single dominant seventh chord that could be found in these 12 keys can be related to one single key now and really create all sort of, sorts of complex motion, which is great because we get a real variety of sound and uh, you know some really interesting um, things with that. So. That's a really cool development. It's a major development. Um, and again, it's because of temperament. Uh, Howard Goodall in his book, um, Big Bangs, Five Inventions That Change Music Forever, speaks of temperament as one of the five inventions that change music forever. The other one, another one was piano. Um, 
where I think he's gone, uh, not gone wrong, but his, his list isn't complete, is that blues almost had as much of a far-reaching effect, effect as temperament did, and nobody's noticing this. Okay, so I'm coming along to say, hey, this is what is. Okay, so uh, again, uh, the first system is major key based. The second system, the major minor key system, is minor key based. And why is that so? Because when the complexity happened, they noticed that they could start to tweak, easily tweak the uh, what's called the Aeolian scale in the Greek modes. It's called the relative minor scale in uh, the major minor key system. The relative minor scale became tweaked, and that's where all even more complexity came through was with this tweakery of this minor scale. They did not tweak the major scale, all right? The major scale remained, but the minor scale was the focus point. And so we could say the second system, the one we're under now, the major minor key system is actually a minor based system because all the focus went to the minor keys. And indeed, minor keys are awesome and the fact that they were tweaked allows for a great deal of chromaticism in both improvisation and composition. Uh, you get such rich sound movements because of that and um, it's a great thing. It's not a bad thing. Uh, all I'm saying is we have to recognize these three systems and maybe give them equal priority because they all deserve it. Uh, the third system, the blues, I call key blending and that's based on the dominant seventh chord. Uh, if you ever learn the blues, there are a one chord, a four chord, and five chord are all seventh chords, okay? Uh, which, by the way, could have never happened in the first system, the Greek system, that the, the uh, seventh chords are unique to each key and you can't combine chords from other keys. Every key has its own unique seventh chord. So if you took a G blues, G7 comes from the key of C, C7 comes from the key of F, and D7 comes from the key of G. So we're mixing chords from three keys. This couldn't have happened before temperament. And the reason why the blues couldn't have happened during the development of the major minor key system after temperament is because it was verboten. What they do in the blues is completely verboten. And I'll go into more detail with that as I drill down into the three systems in the future. Uh, right now I'm giving an overview, but the, uh, when we start our climb through music theory, I'm going to start with the Greek modes and explain those. However, we do need a basic understanding of the Greek modes. But before we do this, let's, let's talk about historically why we have the situation we have today. Um, you go back to Box Day, uh, which I guess is the late 1600s, something like that. I'm not good with dates. I've always been bad at history. But around that era, early 1700s, late 1600s, Johann Sebastian Bach, genius beyond compare. I don't think there's ever been a human being that had the genius that Bach had. It, what he did was unbelievable. Uh, all right, so in any case, uh, around Bach's time is when temperament occurred, the world-changing temperament, and secondly, Probably that's when they started tweaking this minor scale, okay, and getting all these different changes. Now, that, from the 1600s, okay, on up to almost the present day, we have to say up to the turn of the century when, when we turned into the 20, 20th century is when all of a sudden things began to change rapidly. That's the time of the Industrial Revolution. And people like to think of the Industrial Revolution as a change in the technology. In other words, they were making machines do work and stuff like that. It's similar to the big change that happened with computers nowadays. But this, um, this was like automation, using machines, making cars. Uh, discoveries like the light bulb, uh, uh, the telegraph, uh, intercontinental communication systems. All this began to develop around the same time. So you can't say... It's just a matter of industry. It's not an industrial revolution. It's actually a revolution of the mind because also the arts were starting to change around this time. Only makes sense, you know. It's a synergy. Everything affects everything else. Must have been pretty wonderful, you know, uh, to see all these changes occurring so rapidly. And of course, just like people have resistance to computer technology, uh, you know, back then people were saying, oh, you know, these machines are going to take our jobs and blah, blah, blah. They were saying it even then. 
All right, so what happened was we have to look at classical music. It was following the system for hundreds of years, the major minor key system, the one you are taught in school, the one we all assume is the system of music, okay? So uh, what happened around the turn of the century was that we moved from, say, Baroque period Bach into uh, 17, 1800s classical period, and then uh, late 19th century into the 20th century, we get Romanticism, and then right after Romanticism, we get Impressionism, and then Modernism. Now, the Romantics pretty much followed the same rules as the classical guys, but they were taking it as far as they could within that system, and without trying to draw from any other systems to get a new sound. They were working within the system, but stretching it as much as they could. However, there was a kind of restlessness that grew, and it took uh, Claude Debussy, the classical composer, to start messing with um, whole tone scales, which are very uh, exotic sounding scales, but also he resurrected the seven Greek modes. And since that resurrection, it's been appended to our modern system. When the modes started coming about, then later on uh, in the jazz era, they were looking at the modes and messing with that. You could look into John Coltrane, uh, was doing modal jazz after a point. Now, um, when you picture this time, this period, like late 19th century turning into the 20th century, we have two phenomena, the European phenomena of uh, Impressionism and Modernism, and then you have the American phenomenon of blues and then finally jazz, which became a sophisticated form. Blues broke rules between the classical and the Greek systems. They broke rules of those two systems. And the beautiful thing about music is if you break a rule, you can make a great discovery in something that sounds really cool, okay? So uh, we can say that um, uh, the Europeans, now that we're having, we're getting intercontinental uh, communication, we're getting uh, wax records, records made on wax, so they could be shipped across seas and people could hear American music, which was all the rage, by the way. They loved what they were hearing. It was like nothing they ever heard before. And of course it was like nothing they ever heard before because these, these uh, African-American musicians broke all these rules and they made something sound different but really kind of cool and kind of interesting. So the Europeans loved us. You know, they loved American music. When I say us, I mean, really, it is the, the black population, the slave population of America at the time, uh, developing uh, new musical sounds, and then white musicians listening to it going, hey, I like that, let's, let's be like that, let's make music like that, it's cool. And so the white musicians followed the black ones, helped to develop um, uh, black music. The tendency of the European white civilization is to overdevelop things, and unfortunately, that's why rock and roll became rock later on. It lost the roll, uh, which is the bluesy element of rock and roll, and also the energetic, youthful component of it. It to began to take itself seriously, let's put it that way. And uh, jazz, by its nature, was actually a very playful form at its inception. That's the way all great music starts. You're just playing. You're having fun. All right, so now... We have these Europeans that are listening to the sounds on the one hand of Debussy who's introducing the Greek modes and on the other they're listening to the blues and jazz and they're going, wow, this is new. And it, the thing is the Industrial Revolution rolled in so quickly that the, the theoreticians didn't even bother. They were so used to the, the default system we were using, they didn't even bother to say, hey, wait a second, we've got to make adjustments for these other systems. No. Instead, because Europeans are the way they are, like we own the world, all the white people own the world for some reason, uh, they think, okay, well, our system is still the best. Why adjust it to these, you know, menial other systems? Not so. They're tremendously important systems as well. Okay. So, in jazz, you have the phenomenon, one of the phenomena in jazz is stacking chords really high. All right. In other words, you have a root, a third, a fifth, a seventh, then you go into a ninth, a thirteenth. You're, you're really push a stacking that. Now the Impressionists were using these stacked chords as well. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I say our chord naming theory is 
about 80% right, but I can, I can fix the whole thing and make it 100% correct. Um, but every, the point is that this all stuff all rushed through so quickly that even the theoreticians didn't have time to look back and say, hey, wait a second, this is this and that's that. So here I am, a theoretician, saying, okay, hey, wait a second, this is this and that's that, and that's what I'm going to give to you. Now, let me, the first thing we need to do is understand the Greek modes and the major minor key system. Now, I cannot do that in one fell swoop, swoop in a 15-minute uh, se sequence here. So I'll give you a rough idea, and then later on I'm going to drill down very specifically into each of these systems. Okay, so as our basis uh, study key, we always use the key of C because we don't have to think in sharps or flats. Okay, now... Uh, first of all, in the Greek system, we have seven notes. By the way, this is a, a two-octave C scale, and sometimes I have to cross over the octave to explain things, so uh, so you understand that. We have do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, okay. So in any case, um, the Greek modes are actually very, very simple, all right? Where you see this C, let's draw an imaginary line, and we're just going to stop. No, actually, we're not going to stop there. Um, if I sing the C scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, that gives me one particular uh, tonal quality. But if I were to change the root, now the root is the gravity note. When you go ti, do, you want to go to do. It just trips over that note, okay? So uh, in any case, um, you would think that would be the extent of it, but no, actually... I could start on re and get re mi fa so la ti do re. Now you're probably still hearing re going to do. So you're you're locked into that uh, root center. So what I need to do on the guitar is kind of cleanse your palate so you forget the key sound. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'll play a few chords. And that's all it takes for you to change root in your brain. Now, we have Re Mi Fa So La Ti Do Re. Let me play that on the guitar for you. Okay. Now, notice I'm playing this D minor chord. All right, now here's the thing, on each step of the scale you can build a chord, and it's actually the chord as a root chord is what creates the mode, if it's a root chord. In other words, if I have a progression going the D minor, F, G, D minor, likely I'll, I'll stop on the D minor as the root chord because our brain wants to take us there to rest. Feels like it's resting. I could try to rest on, rest on the F. It might work. Wait, sorry. Now you can still hear wanting to go back to D minor. Let's try the G and see if it rests on the G. No, it wants to drop back down. Now all those chords I played were directly taken out of the key of C. Those are chords that are proper to the key of C. All right. But I've made the root now, the D note. Da, 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 da. And if I were to play this, da, 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 da. All right, that last note again was a D, not the C, not Do, but Re becomes the root, okay? Now, the same is true for all the other notes of the key of C. I could make E the root, I could make F the root, I could make G the root, I could make A the root, and I could make B the root. Now, I have to tell you this one uh, pro proviso that goes with this is that some of the roots have much greater power than other roots. In other words, E as a root is kind of weak, and F as a root is kind of weak. But G is pretty strong, A is pretty strong, D is pretty strong, and C is pretty strong. I'll get to that in the future. It's called the relative strengths of the modes. But all you need to know is this simple idea. 
if I sing C to C, that's got a fancy Greek name called the Ionian mode. If instead I sing D to D, that is called the Dorian mode. E to E is called the Phrygian mode. F to F is called the Lydian. G to G is Mixolydian, not Mixolydian like everybody likes to say. I don't know why they get that wrong. Mixolydian. Uh, a, Aeolian. B, Locrian. The weakest root there is, in fact, it's rootless as far as I see. All right, so you make a root out of one of these notes, and then you could combine the notes of the scale, but it'll always want to go back to that one root that you've created. Especially when there's a chord involved, the chord will, will really lock the root down. In the case of what I was uh, playing just before, I played a D minor here. This is precisely where you build a D minor chord in the key of C. So we've created a minor sounding scale using a minor chord, and we've also used that minor chord to root to the D note. I hope this all makes sense. All right, now here's what happened with the major minor key system. And one has to wonder if this was done deliberately or not. And that's the difference between fact and conspiracy, what they call facts and conspiracy theory is something happens in the world is it random or did somebody intend that to happen? The conspiracy theorist believes that somebody intends this to happen. The uh, skeptic tends to say, well, it was random. Now, here is the weird thing, though, and I'll get into my conspiracy theory about this. I talked with this uh, with James Corbett. And, of course, my idea may be totally wrong, but it works as a model. And in neurolinguistic programming, I know a lot of people think that's evil and bad, but actually, just like any weapon, it's neutral until it's used as such. Uh, actually, neurolinguistic programming, I had um, done some deep therapy with a therapist years ago, and he changed my life with it and to the, for the positive. So it can be used as a tool for healing and health, by the way. Uh, okay, so now this is what happened. You see I'm pointing to the C note over here as the relative major and to the A note over there as the relative minor. What happened in the classical days is goodbye these modes forever. We only have now as root possible roots C and A, okay? And the when we root on the C we get a major sounding scale, so that's called the relative ma major. When we root on the uh, sixth step of the scale, we get a minor sounding scale, and that's called the relative minor. Now, those distinctions, major and minor, exist within these modes that I crossed out as well. All right? Why are they gone? Well, I have one speculation on that, and I've spoken about this before. Um, the Greeks believed that each of these modes could evoke a psychological state in a human being. Now. For example, I spoke in the podcast with James and Ricky about the Mixolydian scale, which is based on C, D, E, F, on the G note. Uh, the Mixolydian scale, it was thought to, to promote a sense of partying and revelry and having fun. The D. Dorian scale was considered to inspire militarism and, uh, and uh, military kind of action. Now, here's a cool fact. In the early 60s, the Mixolydian, because of the Beatles actually, and because of the blues, which again I'll explain in the future, the Beatles uh, uh, influenced an entire generation with their music. And I'd say about, I would make a guess, and one day I'm going to do, I'm going to look at every one of their songs and see what the statistics really are. But uh, I would say a good 75% of their music is based in the Mixolydian mode. And what psychological state is that? Partying. Well, when you think of the hippies, early hippies especially, uh, they were partying a bunch. They were having, they were the first to create wild dancing, free dancing, it was no longer ballroom dancing, and uh, they were taking plenty of uh, euphoric drugs to make them, uh, you know, experience uh, the world in a fresher way or more interesting way. Um, and their minds were being expanded uh, as a side effect, which uh, you can refer to people like Terence McKenna about that sort of thing or uh, before then Timothy Leary, 
who was suspected of being CIA. I'm not sure what the truth is. Anyway, now when you, when you, I said the Mixolydian mode is kind of partying and revelry. The um, uh, Dorian mode is militaristic. Now, this is interesting because later on in the 60s, you get bands like the Allman Brothers and Santana, they were doing a lot of Dorian music, a lot of Dorian music. So the party, when you think of militarism and violence, well, then you think of the Chicago riots and you think of the Vietnam War protests and all this stuff. Basically, tempers were, were increasing in the late 60s and it was less love and peace and more let's do something about these bastards that are doing horrible things to people. So uh, uh, the Dorian mode starts figuring, it, figuring in at that point. Is there a connection? I don't know. Could be coincidence. Uh, could be purposely done. But the point being that the church, when we go back to the times when uh, the composers uh, were working with the church, somebody, somebody said, let's get rid of these modes and let's make a major and minor key system. That may be because of temperament. It could be the very reason for it. Maybe it's totally benign that they did it. But one way or another, the Greek modes were phased out. Okay. Now, what the difference is here is, you remember when I said C, D, E, F, G, A, B can all be a root. In the major minor key system, only if you want a major root, you have to go to the C note. You can't get a major root from the F or the G, which are also major bass scales. This is the only one you could get a major basis from. And similar with the minor uh, modes, uh, Dorian, um, uh, Phrygian, and Aeolian, they only kept the Aeolian mode. Now the Aeolian mode is, is probably the saddest, most somber of all the, all the minor key modes. It's dead serious, okay? So, uh, yeah, so we have to wonder why all of a sudden the mode system disappeared. And I could have, like I said, it could have been just inspiration, this new idea of combining keys together and, and now they could do it. Maybe they said we need a new system, this one works better, which in a sense you could say, considering the times, it probably did work better. However, now we have a, a different situation because the Greek modes are reintroduced and the, uh, the blues is introduced. So now the major minor key system says, a root C and a key C are the same thing. A root A and the, the key A minor, the, the key called A minor and the root A are the same. In other words, I can have no more roots from the key of A minor. There can only be an A, all right? From the key of C major, I can no longer have any other roots except for its relative minor over here. Now, before in the Greek mode system, a key didn't mean a root. A key meant a collection of seven notes, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, from which you could make any one of these a root note. What the major minor system did, it said a key and a root are the same thing. All right? This is where a great deal of problems arise. Um, a quick example is uh, if I play a Mixolydian progression, First of all, I'm going to show you the one chord, the four chord, and the five chord of the key of G. The one, four, five was really popular in early 60s music, songs like Wild Thing. And you could name a million songs that go... I mean, literally, there's just like tons of songs based on just that from the early 60s. Anyway, one, four, five are the three major chords of a key. Now, I'm going to root on the D chord. And again, I have to cleanse our palate a bit, so I have to um, refer to a different key for a moment. Okay, so now I'm going to, we have the 1, G, the 4, C, and the 5, D, and I'm going to root on D instead of G. And you've probably heard a million songs that do this. Uh, one would be Sweet Home Alabama, based on those three chords, okay? Now, if you remember, I took these chords from the key of G, but I rooted on the D chord, okay? So, in the major minor key system, if I walked into a jam session and I, I didn't have a chart for the song they were playing at the moment, if, if they're jamming on this, I say, what key are we in? They'll go, D. 
knee-jerk reaction. But wait a second, these three chords came out of the key of G. Why am I calling it the key of D? Because in the major minor key system, if you have a root chord, that's the name of the key. This is BS and it's confusing as hell. Actually, these chords derive from the key of G and the best way to describe it, if I walked into that room, they'd say we're doing a D mixolydian progression. And that would be quite enough to explain to me, oh, okay, cool, I got it. All right, so you can see the language barrier, the problems in the language. If I say this is the key of D, where did the C chord come from? In the key of D, there's a C sharp chord, C sharp uh, diminished. Why is there a C chord on the key of D? It doesn't even make sense. Now, granted, the G chord in the key of D would be, exists in the, the G chord exists in the key of D, and it's called the four chord of the D of, uh, key of D. But still, that's, that C chord is, is standing out like the elephant in the room, and nobody's talking about it. All right, so that's the difference between the major minor key system and the, the modes, okay? Now, remember I called the modes uh, isolated keys. You couldn't bring in chords from another key, and indeed, this mixolydian progression is all from the same key of G. There are no chords from outside of that key of G to make that progression. In the min major minor key system, we have something called combinatory keys, and that will explain the C chord. Uh, the way they explain the C chord is through a number. They call it uh, the uh, flat seven major. Uh, related to a D, it is the flat seven major. Don't worry about that language if you don't understand it. I'm going to explain all that stuff in the future. But um, uh, so that's the way the major minor key system would explain away that C. It's not a true explanation. It's just putting a name to something that they don't have an explanation for. And the Greek modes supply that explanation. Oh, it's a chord from the same key of G. But wait, it's a D root. Ah, my mind, right? I have so many students that I have to deprogram to, to get them to forget this idea that key and root are the same thing. Again, what is the difference? In the major minor key system, when I play this progression, they say I'm in the key of D. What they really mean to say is I'm rooted in D. It's not the key of D, it's rooted in D. Um, but now that leads me to the Greek modes where I am in the key of G and I'm rooting on the D chord. Again, the classical major minor key system says this progression is in the key of D. Because why? Because we have a D major root chord, therefore it's the key of D major. Wrong. All right, now the Greek mode system says this progression is drawn from the key of G, but it's rooted on the key of G's D chord. Okay, so that's the situation between the major minor key system and um, the Greek modes. Now I have to bring in the blues. What the blues did was to... Um, well, first, let me, let me say, again, the Greek modes, isolated keys, major minor key system, com combinatory keys. Okay, that C chord comes from, if I'm thinking this is the key of D, then that C chord comes from another key, all right? Uh, and then probably that's where they'd start thinking the key of G. Maybe it's drawn from the key of G. But the logic is fuzzy at best, all right? Now the blues. The blues is what I call key blending. And primarily, it's uh, blending simply, uh, all right, we have to go back to the major minor key system for this. By the way, because they, they tossed out the modes and they only gave us relative major and relative minor keys, that doesn't mean that the relationship between relative major and relative minor isn't of absolute paramount of por importance. It is, it's very, very important to understand the key of C major and its sister key, A minor, speaking from the uh, uh, major minor key system at least, C major and A minor, all right, are very closely related. Uh, for one thing, I'll give you a quick example. You could draw three minor modes from uh, the key of C and three, uh, three, I'm sorry, three minor chords from the key of C and three major chords from the key of C. Now I'm going to show you the relationship between relative major and minor. In the key of C, I could go one, four, five. This is the C chord. I count up uh, one, two, three, four steps to make an F chord, and then one whole step to make a G chord, one, four, and five. 
Well, the one four five phenomena happens also when we root on the A chord. A minor, D minor, and E minor. Well, when C went to F in this one, that was four scale steps up. Well, one, two, three, four in the minor, A to D minor is also four steps up. It's a perfect fourth away. And then the E minor is a whole step from there, which is a perfect fifth from the A. All right, now, when we do this, the G chord is a perfect fifth from the C. When we do this, the E minor chord is a perfect fifth from A. So we could get a little sister version of the one, four, five done in the minors. Okay, so, um, that's one clue that this, the relationship between C and its relative minor are very close. One is major sounding, one is minor sounding. Now, what the blues did was they took, um, this is, all right. They took a key like, hmm, how am I gonna describe this? Let's go back to relating each system to a particular chord type, major, minor, or seventh. In the Greek modes, we said it's major. In the uh, uh, major minor key system, we said it's minor. And in the blues system, it's the dominant seventh. Now, the dominant seventh chord is really a major chord with an extra note on it. So it's, it's a major bass chord. But if we took a chord like a G7, which is a major bass chord, and we added what would ostensibly have been the note from a G minor chord, in other words, mixing G major and G minor with that little extra added seventh note, we get the blues sound. Now the best way to describe this, if you're a guitar player and you're somewhat near my age, uh, you'll, you'll have heard of the Hendrix chord. What is called the Hendrix chord is specifically an E7 sharp nine chord. And I always explain when I talk about the blues that the, the sharp nine chord encompasses all of blues harmony in one chord. It, exp it kind of states all of blues harmony in one chord. Now, this is the E7 sharp nine chord. You might know it from... Uh, Purple Haze, but uh, Beatles use it in Taxman. Okay, E7, the sharp nine chord is a cool ass chord. And the weird thing is there is no one single scale you can build this chord from. You have to combine two scales. See what I mean by com um, uh, blending keys together. Now let's drill a little deeper. Um, you could hear within the E7 sharp nine, the major chord. All right, you can kind of hear the major chord in there. Now. There's something call, called the third, which determines whether a chord is major or minor. Here's an E chord. Root, the third, and the fifth. It's this third I'm concerned about. If I flat that third, I get E minor, and here I get E major, right? Never mind the seventh, okay? Now, if I take what would be the root and the third up top of that chord, you can hear it's a minor sounding chord, but below that note, I also have the major note. And if I combine those three, now you're hearing the blues sound. The only thing that rounds it all off is this one, is the seventh chord, this flatted seventh, that gives us the fullness of the E7 sharp nine chord or whatever root uh, sharp nine chord you use. So now what's going on is, if I'm if thinking in terms of the key of C, uh, G7 is native to the key of C. So we're gonna look at the G7 chord, and as I told you, a G7 chord is just a G major chord with an added note to it. Now, what if I played a G minor, a G major, and a G7 all together? That's what you get minor against major. This is something that never would have happened in classical music. In fact, it, it's, it's so much would have never happened that they wouldn't even think about the idea because it would be ridiculous. If uh, someone walked up to Bach and he had a piece in a major key and said, hey, Johan, why don't you play a minor scale against that? He'd be like, what are you talking about? 
except he did do that and he snuck it in. I found that at, uh, back in music theory school. Maybe I'll talk about that story later. But he was so ahead of his time that very quickly, it wouldn't last, to, you wouldn't sit on it like this, but quickly in passing in his counterpoint, he would do these like heavyweight jazz chords. And nobody, he snuck them by. He was from the future. He knew. He knew something. Uh, all right, so that is really the long and short of it. First level theory, Greek modes, is isolated keys. Second level theory, the major minor key system, is combinatory keys. You could combine them in modular units, but not blend them. In the blues, we literally blend keys together. We play the key of G minor against the key of G major, if that's how you'll think of it. All right. Um, there was no phenomenon before this that made this happen. The picture, colorful picture I like to give about this is probably not true, but uh, is that um, let's picture the black slaves out in the cotton fields. And uh, when they were exported, is that the word, from Africa, uh, they were probably not at all familiar with tempered music and this idea that many keys can work with each other. And pre-temperament, by the way, if you look, uh, say from the 1500s and before then, if you look at all the world's music, you'll get a kind of droney sound, kind of like Indian when you... Now what I have is a root note that I'm droning and I'm playing a scale instead. But you hear no chords moving, it's just a drone. Well, you could find that in the Scottish bagpipe, that kind of drone. Find it in Indian music, you could find it in Turkish music. Um, some music uh, tended toward pentatonics, but there's still no chord movement, okay? It's all within the same key. There's no key changing in any of that music. So um, in any case, so you have these black slaves who are not familiar with harmonic movement as rich as we have it from the European tradition at this time. And they're out working in the cotton fields. And you know, back in those days, they, the white slave owners, everybody in those days, they didn't have radios or media. so. They learned, it was a family tradition that somebody had to learn the piano in the family, if not everyone. So, you know, they're hearing late at night the piano playing all these chord changes and they're going, whoa, that's kind of cool. But they don't have access to it, all right? So maybe they're thinking, I want a harmony instrument too. And the easiest one they could build is a cigar box banjo or a cigar box guitar. And so they start creating the blues and they start playing seventh chords and singing minor scales against these seventh chords. Now, mind you, think about the blues. I mean, this is fantastic. I mean, it's really fantastic. The blues, there was once a comedian that joked, you know, he goes, blues players, man. He goes, they're singing about the most horrific shit. You know, my wife left me, my dog bit my leg off, and they got a big smile on their face while they're singing about it. Well, what is that? From a musician's perspective, it's transmutation of negative feelings into something positive that we call music. But that's not the fantastic thing I'm talking about right now. Um, uh, all right, so uh, uh, where was I? Pause. When you think that, if you think of the blues as bittersweet, well, you think you're combining a major chord and a minor chord and a seventh chord. Now, what are the qualities? Happy, sad, and anxious, all right? What better way to describe the blues than those three qualities? I mean, the blues is bittersweet. There's a celebration in the fact that, well, I could sing about this and I could jam on the guitar um, and I could get audiences clapping. That's happiness. But what the song is actually talking about is really sad and when you have sad situations, you tend to be a little anxious. So uh, basically, that is the beauty, the amazing coincidence of all this stuff that made the blues happen. And I am so much in love with this. I guess you could tell I'm beaming right now thinking about it. And this is what I want to convey to other human beings, that we have a treasure here in American music, and that treasure should not be lost uh, amongst the... Uh, new generation of computer uh, computer generated composition there's nothing wrong with using the computer as a tool for composition but don't emphasize texture which is sound color cool virtual instruments over beauty of melody cool harmonic movement and modulation and great rhythm all right so that's my lecture today i expected it to be short and it's really long hope you enjoyed it take care